Hi, I'm Connie McLeod. Welcome to Creative Heroes. A creative hero is someone who lives a fully creative life. I can think of no one who exemplifies this more than my friend Marie Constantine. We're at Marie's camp today on the mighty Atchafalaya River, deep in Louisiana's Cajun country. Marie is going to talk to us about photography, playing the fiddle, and living a fully creative life. My name is Marie Josephine Constantine, and I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. I was raised um, in my early childhood years, I was raised with extreme wealth. And then we had a, a family falling out, and our family separated off from the main family. And so that, was, that, that had a tremendous impact on my life and who I am. I never wanted to be a photographer. It was a complete accident that I was a photographer. I just um, was working for the Catholic Student Center and they needed somebody to take pictures for a four-page tabloid and nobody wanted to do it and I knew I could borrow a camera and so you know so I did it and um, I noticed immediately that the pictures the composition was really good but I didn't understand the technical part of that and so um, I had actually taken some photos of Bishop Ott for you know for the this little publication and Business Report magazine wanted those photos for a piece that they were doing. They didn't know that I wasn't a professional. They just thought I was because the photos were really excellent. And so they, they bought the photos from me and they paid $50. And I was just like, oh my God, somebody paid me $50 back then for, I thought I could actually do this for a living. That was the first time I actually thought, my gosh, I could make a living at this. If someone was willing to pay me $50 for a photo, well, then they contacted me one day and they said, you know, would you like to be a freelancer for us? Well, I was stunned because they didn't know I didn't know what I was doing. And it was a perfect scenario because it was a magazine. They um, gave me the assignment. They didn't come with me. Had they come with me, they would have known I didn't know what I was doing. The person that I was photographing didn't know I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I just shot six rolls of film. And, you know, I just shot... And then uh, the diocese was allowing me to use their darkroom to, you know, process all my stuff because I was doing stuff for them too and, you know, freelancing for them. And so I would go to the diocese and process my film and everything. And I remember being in there praying just, I mean, just fervently, dear God, please, just one frame. If I have one frame, that's all I need, you know. Because in those days, you picked the photo that you gave to the magazine. It was your choice. You picked it. And, you know, because it took a long time to print it. You just picked it, printed it, gave it to them. So they didn't know that the whole other six rolls were, you know. So when I, when I actually went to take the, f the photos, because I didn't understand what I was doing technically, I just knew if I turned that thing, you know, that aperture thing, like a machine gun, something was going to be okay. So I would have my finger on the motor drive and just, you know, and something was good. So um, eventually I took a little class on, you know, this is a f-stop and, started to understand those technical things. But I had the composition, and, and that's the hard part. When I started taking photos, it was clear to me that I was not going to get hired on by a big newspaper or uh, something like that because of the way things were with women and photography. Photography was pretty much, at that time, a man's world. It, it did shortly thereafter transition, but it really was just something that you know men were going to get hired. I was not going to get hired. And so the way I dealt with it, I, I was in journalism school, I just gave myself assignments. And I gave myself fabulous assignments. And um, I could get these jobs that I gave myself. I, I, I would uh, do the photography and write a story or just do the photography or just write a story. And I could submit it to the paper and it would get published. But I knew I was never going to be hired. And so um, one of the jobs I gave myself was to go up in an ultralight and photograph another ultralight and write a story on it. And then I gave myself a, an assignment where I was out in the swamp photographing a woman that was studying the um, alligators and whether the, the alligators are males or females based on the critical temperatures that the incubation, that the, the, the eggs reach during incubation. So I gave, I, I gave myself, I went to Haiti and I actually had better, photog better assignments than any photographer because they weren't getting assignments like that. I mean, you know, when you give yourself your own assignments, of course you're going to give yourself just fabulous things that you love to do. So in a sense, it was a big blessing to me. The, bi the biggest gift that ever happened to me was that I was never going to be hired by a big paper as a photographer because then I had to 
um, you know, then I had to work for smaller publications like a business magazine. And, and so I just made it work. The photo with Mother Teresa and, and how I got to that place um, developed sort of accidentally. I came in from work one evening on an exhausting photo shoot and I just flopped down on the floor and I flipped on the TV and it just happened to be the channel was turned to Mother Teresa. And at that very moment in, in the scene, she held a man that was, you know, appeared to be like 60, 70, 80 pounds that was dying. And, and she just looked at him and she said, God doesn't do this. We do it because we don't share what we have. And it was for some reason, I, I just started my business and, you know, I was just focused on myself and it just hit me really hard. And I said, I don't do anything for anybody. And then I remembered years ago, I had taken these pictures, you know, when she came to Louisiana on those three trips. And I thought, well, I think those nuns are still there. I'll go down. And so the next day I went down and, uh, to the soup kitchen and I knocked on the door and the nun answered and I said, do you need any help? And she said, we need some help in the soup kitchen. And so that's how all this got started. And this priest called me one day. He, he was a Spanish priest from Spain. And uh, he wanted a picture of himself and Mother Teresa. And I'd met him a few times. And, you know, the last thing I wanted was to add something on my list of things to do for the day. But I put it on my list. And when I got down to, you know, number six or, you know, whatever it was, I said, okay, I got to mail this to Father Pasquale. And so I had this box of photos and I went in there. And, and I had already, you know, made all these photos for Sister Sylvia for the profession. And so I had, I always kept extras. And so he wanted it for his prayer book. And so I thought, well, I was looking through this, and there, here's this sort of vertical. I'm thinking, oh, he'll love this. It's perfect. It's vertical. So there wasn't a whole lot of love and thought that went into this. I just wanted to scratch him off my list and do what he wanted, you know. And so years later, I was um, at some friend's house, and it was Easter, and I kept getting my phone kept ringing. I'm like, God, how could somebody be calling me at Easter time? I mean, it's, it's Easter. We're all supposed to be off, and people are calling me. And so I, I thought, I never ignore my phone, but I'm just going to ignore my phone and take care of myself. And so it just kept ringing and ringing. I'm like, my God, somebody must have died. So I answered the phone. It's Father Pasquale, and he's all out of breath. And, you know, he's like, he, he has this accent. You can't understand him. And he's like, bup, 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 you know, talking. And, and he wants my negative, and I'm trying to slow him down. I don't know what he's asking. And, he, and I said, Father, I, you know, you want my negative. And I said, if you want it. You, don't you want a picture? You, surely you don't want the negative. If I give you the negative, the, you know, there'll never be another photo again, you know, because I won't have the negative. And, and so he got really frustrated with me, and he said, Marie, what's the matter with you? This is a great honor. And, and so I'm like, Father, I don't know what you're saying to me, you know. So when I finally got him to slow down, and what he was telling me was that the, he was in Rome, and they had a pile of pictures, uh, they were preparing for Mother Teresa's beatification. They didn't have a photo that they thought would work. And he goes, I have a photo. And he reaches into his prayer book and pulls out this photo that, you know, I had given two seconds thought to. And he lays it down and bing, that's it. And, and so um, fast forward, there I am, I guess the following year, on the roof of the Vatican with CBS Sunday morning filming me and Charles Osgood and um, they want to photograph my reaction as the photo is unveiled in front of, you know, 300,000 people. And so this little, just this little thing that I did that wasn't, I wasn't even feeling loving like I was with the soup kitchen. I was just sort of responding to, you know, another person. I mean, we, in life, we, you know, we have to give back and we have to, when it's inconvenient, we have to do things for people. And that's all that was. That was not like, you know, oh, I, I know this guy. He's a close friend. I have to do the, It was like, no, get this off your list. And then my whole life explodes after that. You know, Mother Teresa used to always say, don't look for big things. Do little things with great love. And I think part of the reason why my life is so wonderful is that I don't worry whether something's going to get me an honor or not. I simply do it, and I do it, I try to do it with love in my heart. Sometimes I just do it because it's something I should do for someone or whatever. But whatever it is, I don't, um, or I try not to say, well, this is a big thing, you know, or this is a really important person. I'm going to pay more attention to them. 
and then this is a lesser thing. I try to look at it as the same, as, you know, you can do little things with great love, and somehow those little things turn into something big. And even with the camp, you know, I just had this visualization of, you know, my family was just so devastated by this breakup. And my first thought of the camp was to have a fabulous place where people can come together and have relationships where my family can come and heal themselves. And, um, and I think the camp has sort of turned out like that. You know, one time I had a party and I asked Father Carville to give a blessing and he, he didn't know that, that this was my wish for the camp. And he, you know, in the blessing, he said, Marie draws people together. She brings together, he goes, there's every age group here. There's whole families here just, you know, enjoying this camp. And she just brings, and I thought, I almost cried because I thought, wow, I guess I did my vision, my vision of the camp that it would be a place where people could just, you know, connect. I wanted to take up the fiddle because I thought it would be cool to be able to play some tunes. But really what happened with the fiddle and me was I started meeting these wonderful people that also wanted to take up an instrument. And we started getting together and having parties and we come down to the camp and we drink whiskey and play the fiddle and we suck but we didn't care. And sometimes we'd hire someone to come over here and teach us a lesson and we'd cook and sometimes they'd pitch tents and they'd spend the night. And so the whole thing with the fiddle turned into something else where the end product of actually playing a song well was was really sort of not even in the mix after a while. It was just more like, we're having a blast. And then we would go hear our favorite fiddle players. You know, we'd go do that together and go out dancing. And, you know, and then I dance really bad. I'm kind of clumsy. And so, you know, one friend was like, we got to teach you how to dance, Marie, you're really horrible, you know. So it's just the whole, like, it, you know, getting, just immersing yourself in this wonderful life. It's that, that journey it's not getting there, that would actually be disappointing. It's just this journey that's completely wonderful. If we can find something that is actually a journey, that is a process, and, and take all this stuff off of us, this pressure that makes us feel like we have to arrive, well, what's wrong with just, what if you were building a boat? What if it took you a whole lifetime? So what? If you could somehow enter into the joy of that moment of what you're doing and not be so focused on that end result. And I think that that robs us of our happiness. We get robbed of our happiness because we have these expectations of, that are way too complex and we can actually be happy um, getting a 220 grit sandpaper and, and seeing the beauty pop out of a piece of wood. I think when you live a creative life, you, you do find a lot of joy when you just slow it down and stop putting all this stuff on you. Stop thinking you have to go build some monument or do some great thing or get some award. They can keep the awards. You know, I would rather be with my friends, you know, having some fun. To me, that is, is joy.